I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University and a visiting professor at the Catholic University of Leuven. Together with my colleague Andrea Robilio, we present to you these lectures on Thomas Aquinas on the Nature and Attainment of Happiness, our Aquinas course for fall 2014. This is class number 10, uh, Aquinas on Faith and Vera was on Knowing Separate Substances. I'll begin here with uh, this video, video 10a, with Aquinas on Faith and Scripture. So let's proceed. Aquinas as Interpreter of Scripture. In the course required article by Thomas Prugel, Thomas Aquinas as Interpreter of Scripture, uh, a basic and clear introduction to the hermeneutics and method of Aquinas is provided. And certainly I recommend that most highly, uh, but we can't go through all of that here. While also uh, doing much more, this article nicely clarifies the four senses of Scripture for Aquinas, the literal and the spiritual, dividing the spiritual into the allegorical and the moral and the anagogical. anagogical. Uh, and also with regard to this, I suggest you have a look at this article uh, that I reference here by John Boyle. It's really quite helpful. The main focus of Aquinas, however, is on the literal, since Scripture and its authors is a tool presented by God for teaching and guiding human beings. So we don't just think of it as a text, and a text by human beings, but rather we have to think of the scripture as itself a tool provided by God for the purpose of guiding and teaching human beings toward doing what is right and toward returning to God. So that is, it is a tool crafted by God as primary cause, using secondary causes to communicate to human beings God's will and guidance on the return of creatures to God. It is a communication of truth by God, and so can never be false. Notice, by the way, this reference to primary cause and secondary cause. Uh, my uh, colleague at uh, the Dominican School's uh, House of Studies in, in Washington, D.C., uh, Tim Bellema, has explained that, in fact, the, uh, the Latin translation of the Libre de Causis, the uh, Discourse on the Pure Good in the Arabic, that text on primary and secondary causality played an important role in discussions of Scripture, because God is a primary cause using as tools the various individual authors as secondary causes to communicate God's message. So there's a greater message there, but we'll get into this in some detail later on. <clears throat> Still, the richness of God's communication isn't limited to a historical time, as are secondary causes that authored the writings. Rather, God's communication is timeless, as is God, uh, and also applicable to all times in such a way that Scripture requires reconsideration and study in every period and in every cultural milieu to determine the meaning of God's commands and guidance and its proper application in every era and circumstance. So, Scripture study is something that's ongoing because of that. I won't go through all of the article by Prugel in detail, but here rather recommend it to you very highly. Instead, let's turn to Aquinas' comments on Psalm 31, and then later his explanation of the nature of faith is set out in De Veritate, by question 14, article 2. We take this more uh, purely theological turn simply because Aquinas was first and foremost a theologian. <coughs> And his theological understanding of God and God's communication with creatures in Scripture is, is quite important for understanding the conditions that make possible ultimate human happiness in seeing God face to face or per ascension. So since this contributes to that, and we really have to recognize Aquinas as primarily a theologian, we need to take a bit of a turn in this regard to his theology and see how he understands uh, human beings and reality in accordance with that theological term. In Aquinas' comments on Psalm 31, we see him in, in the act of interpreting Scripture with focus on sin and its impact, along with the importance of clearing the blockage of sin through confession, forgiveness, and divine grace. He writes, quote, When he, namely the psalmist, says, understanding, he shows the effect of his prayer. It is God who says, I will give thee understanding. It is as if God were saying, You seek that I should rescue you, and I will do three things for you. I will give you the gift of understanding, I will instruct you, and I will protect you. 
goes on, For man there are three things that are necessary from God. First, according to Aquinas then, first, he must obtain the gift of grace, so that through it the soul of man may be brought to the point of acting promptly. But as much as man has this gift of grace, it does not suffice unless God moves the soul to the performance of some good work. For that reason, it's fitting that God be active in this way, moving the soul to perform good work, following upon the gift of antecedent grace. However, we receive the gift of grace according to the mode of our nature. That is, we do not receive it in such a way as to avoid all suffering. Thus, God's protection and defense are also necessary, and so first he sets forth the gift of understanding when he says that I will give thee understanding. Quote, ye shall fill him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding, from Ecclesiastes 15.5. This is necessary for man so that he might acknowledge his sin and recognize that he cannot be saved except by God, and of course by God's grace. Secondly, continues Aquinas, he explains how this gift is to be used when he says, I will instruct thee, I will make thy children taught of the Lord, from Isaiah 54, 13. Thirdly, his protection when he says, uh, in this way, namely, his commandments, in which thou shalt go, I will fix my eyes upon thee. That is, I will protect you. The eyes of the Lord behold all the earth and give strength to those who with perfect heart trust in him. And that's from 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. This and the entire commentary shows how Aquinas understands scripture to consist in divine guidance through his literal, literal understanding of this communication of God to human beings. Let's now see him explain his conception of faith and its importance in the De Veritate. So this is De Veritate, question 14, article 2. Knowledge attained through faith, for Aquinas, is an essential part of the thought, of the essential part of his thought, and an aspect of his thought that we have not yet explored in any detail in this course. We will do so now with the assigned readings, then, this particular article, on what is faith. Faith brought about by divine grace allows insights into God and reality, which are not available to all human beings, and which in some cases are not available for understanding at all through natural human powers. The concern of Aquinas, then, is how to understand Hebrews 11.1, 1, quote, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that appear not, quote. In his response, uh, Aquinas sets out uh, his understanding in detail and starts by saying that, quote, this description is a very complete definition, close quote. Now, that's hard to see, so we want to see how exactly how he explicates this. It seems a rather obscure uh, way of defining faith. He continues, It is such not in the sense that it is given under, uh, according to the required form of a definition, but because there is sufficient mention of everything which is necessary for a definition of faith. For sometimes, even when dealing with philosophers themselves, it's enough to mention the principles of syllogisms and definitions, because once we have them, it's a simple matter to reduce them to due form according to the rules of the art. This is clear from three considerations, he writes. First, he says that it mentions all the principles on which the nature of faith depends. All right, so that is the nature of the believer as intellect determined by will in relation to a good, so, in this way, faith involves a good moving the will and a good, quote, to which the understanding gives assent under the influence of the will, close quote. The final good of human beings is twofold, one natural, as capable of being attained by natural powers, and another, quote, which is out of all proportion with man's nature because his natural powers are not enough to attain to it either in thought or desire. Close quote. This latter is promised by divine generosity through scripture, and this is the vision of God in everlasting life. Aquinas here cites John 6.40, quote, 
Everyone who seeketh the Son and believeth in him may have life everlasting. Close quote. So Aquinas is, is explaining in detail what, what is involved in faith quite clearly and uh, distinguishing it. He will distinguish it from other the powers that are involved. Uh, and it reaches something that is beyond the ability of intellect to provide assent to. The part of the response which I think is particularly important for our concerns regarding human nature and the attainment of ultimate happiness come immediately after that text. Here Aquinas speaks of the preordination of human beings to a final end. Now obviously this is quite relevant to us if there is an end for all things, an end for human beings, there's a kind of preordination in the very nature of the human being for this. That is, there's a kind of teleological end to be understood in the nature of each thing. We, saw, we will see something like this, uh, not unrelated in, in a way, uh, in Averroes. A quote, but nothing can be directed to any end unless there pre-exists in it a certain proportion to the end. And it is from this that the desire of the end arises in it. This happens insofar as, in a certain sense, the end is made to exist inchoatively within it, because it desires nothing except insofar as it has some likeness of the end. <clears throat> so in the thing, so Aquinas is saying that in the thing, there will be some likeness to the end to be achieved, likeness in some fashion yet to be explained, uh, and that prompts uh, prompts the desire for an end, a seeking out of likeness, a seeking out of fulfillment in that. I'll continue with the text then. This is why there is in human nature a certain initial participation of the good which is proportionate to that nature. For self-evident principles of demonstration, which are seeds of the contemplation of wisdom, long-distant seeds for that, in a sense, for the contemplation of wisdom, naturally pre-exist in that good, as do principles of natural law, which are the seeds of moral virtue. So the seeds are found in these self-evident principles, and they can be cultivated to the point of having intellectual contemplation or contemplation of wisdom. Now we've seen with Averro is that everything has such a principle in it insofar as every being seeks the final cause of all to the extent that its nature allows. For Aquinas, the same is the case and can be apprehended through philosophy, but Aquinas has a very different understanding of human nature than that of Averroes. For Averroes, this fulfillment takes place within the confines only of a natural uh, a, a natural philosophy and, and the natural abilities of an unaided human being. Averroes never goes beyond that to a notion of grace or to something even greater than that. And in connection with this, it's not surprising then that Averroes has the notion that the only life that human beings have is the life in this world. And so ultimate fulfillment will not be, uh, will not be connecting with or conjoining uh, in the post-mortem existence individual human beings. But this is quite complex and I'll save some of this for the next video. But Aquinas carries on then. For this reason also, for man to be ordained to the good, which is eternal life, there must be some initial participation of it to whom uh, it is uh, in him to whom it is promised. However, eternal life consists in the full knowledge of God, as is clear from John. Now this is eternal life a full knowledge of God. Consequently, we must have within us some initial participation of this supernatural knowledge. We have it through faith, which by reason of an infused light holds those things which are beyond our natural knowledge. So faith allows us to know things about God which are not available through natural knowledge. So right to Aquinas. That is, for Aquinas, in the case of human beings, the full goodness of the highest supranatural end is not attained or even fully understood and known by natural powers. Here, faith plays the key role. Quote, now, in composite things, whose parts have an order, it's customary to call the first part the substance of the thing. For in that part, there is a beginning of the whole. Examples of this are the foundation of a house and the hull of a ship. 
keeping with this, the philosopher says, quote, if being were one whole, its first part would be substance. Close quote. Now, similarly, faith is called the substance of things hoped for, inasmuch as it is for us an initial participation of the eternal life for which we hoped by reason of the divine promise. And in this way, mention is made of the relation between faith and the good which moves the will in its determination of the intellect. So faith and the good which moves the will uh, in its determination of faith and intellect is the doctrine. So uh, let's carry on to the next. But how does will work with intellect precisely in this matter of faith? He goes on and makes it quite explicit here. But, but the will, under the movement of this good, proposes as worthy of assent something which is not evident to the natural <coughs> to the natural human understanding. <coughs> I think I'll pause just for a moment here. I resume now after a small drink of water. So how does will work with intellect? He says, but the will under the movement of this good, uh, proposes as worthy of assent something which is not evident to natural understanding. In this way, it gives understanding a determination to that which is not evident, the determination, uh, the determination namely to assent to it. Therefore, just as the intelligible thing which is seen by the understanding determines the understanding, and for this reason is said to give conclusive evidence to the mind, give it a reason or argument, so also, something which is not evident to the understanding determines it and convinces the mind because the will has accepted it as something to which assent should be given. Notice the should that should be given. Uh, for this reason, another reading has proof, convictio, uh, in place of evidence, argumentum. For it convinces the intellect in the aforesaid manner. So, in the words, Quote, evidence of things that appear not, mention is made of the relation of faith to that to which the understanding assents. So the understanding assents to a proposition of faith, and that's brought about thanks to the will, the will that seeks out good. Aquinas then concludes, consequently, from what has been said, we can establish a definition scientifically and say, faith is a habit of our mind by which eternal life begins in us and which makes our understanding assent to things which are not evident. Close quote. So, that's the definition according to Aquinas. What Aquinas calls the third sign of the good definition is that faith is determined to be distinct from scientific knowledge and understanding, opinion and doubt, prudence and other cognitive habits. So it distinguishes faith but in an appropriate way from these other Acts of, uh, acts of uh, mind, intellect, and will. The third sign is the requirement that the whole definition or part of it be in words. That is, the full meaning has to be included. <clears throat> While the responses to objections 2, 3, and 9 are particularly rich and worthy of study, I think it's best for us to conclude with what Aquinas writes in response to objection 10. It seems to be pretty valuable to me. And it's this, the act of faith consists essentially in knowledge. The act of faith consists in knowledge through the will's assent to something in intellect. And there we find its formal or specific perfection. This is clear from its object, as has been said. Of course, the object of faith are things that have been uh, made available to us as true from God, but are not available to our natural knowing. But with reference to its end, faith is perfected in the affections because it is by reason of charity that it can merit its end. The beginning of faith, too, is in the affections insofar as the will determines the intellect to assent to matters of faith. So this is a kind of affection taking place here. But that act of the will is an act neither of charity nor of hope, but of the appetite seeking a promised good. 
So the appetite is motivated to seek out a promised good, and so uh, it assents to those propositions. From this, it's clear that faith is not in two powers, as in its subject subjects. What we've seen here is that faith for Aquinas involves an assent by the will that moves the intellect to accept what it otherwise, by its nature, would would not. What moves the will is the good. In this case, a supernatural good that is revealed through Scripture and aided by grace. Through Scripture and aided by grace. That is, <clears throat> how is the will so moved? Is it only so moved in the case of Christians? Is there a naturally available indication of the end willed and the need for human beings to transcend the natural to desire what is behind, beyond the natural? These are interesting questions we might take up in class. I think, uh, but we'll also see them see something about these a bit later on uh, as we proceed through the course. So next week we will take up key issues in the Summa Contra Gentilis, uh, including some uh, concerning the understanding of Averroism, which is our next video, 10b. But for now, I'll stop this video, 10a.